Welcome back, fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. I hope you had a wonderful holiday, uh, and whatever holidays that you celebrate, I hope it was great. Um, and Happy New Year's 2020 for the win. Let's hope it will be a great year for all of you, as well as it will be, hopefully, for me. Uh, sorry again for uh, the holidays kind of interfering with our classes, but we are starting up a new year, and hopefully we will be good to go on that. Uh, getting back into a regular basis. Uh, excuse my lighting for today. I was uh, not able to film as soon as I wanted to today, so I'm filming with less outside light than I normally have. So as it continues getting darker outside, my guess is that it will continue to get darker on the video. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm doing my best, but I really wanted to get another class out for you today, so that's what we're doing. And we're just going to have to excuse the lights situation <laughs> and hope for better luck next time. So yeah, today we're going to be discussing the third and final part of our world uh, anal analysis on our world of Kryn. So we're going back to the continent of Ancelon, as we've seen before. If you wanted to look at anything that we actually used the map for, that would be back on part one. Uh, we talked a lot about magic, the basis of the world, uh, locations that are important to the story of the first three books, uh, and that kind of stuff. And then this last part that we had was all about the beings that reside in Kryn and their characteristics and what they are like. And then today we're going to cover the last couple of topics, which are going to be creatures, societies, and a little bit about history. And the reason I say just a little bit about history is because in the, these particular uh, stories, we don't have tons of history in the first three novels, that, which is what we have read previously. So I'm mostly basing it off of what we've already read uh, for this world analysis. So the history portion is just a couple of things. All right. I guess let's go ahead and get started with our creatures. Okay, so creatures. As I discussed in the last uh, class, we discussed what I considered a being and why I picked those different beings to be in the being category versus the creature category because they very could sometimes be both. Um, so what I categorized a being, let's just review. A being to me is a humanoid race with humanoid characteristics and cultures. So, you know, walk on two legs, has a higher mentality, has personalities, has cultures, has different societies, that kind of stuff. Those are beings to me. And then creatures are not necessarily that they don't have any of those traits, but just that they don't have all of those traits uh, or they don't have them on a normal basis, if that makes sense. So for me, a creature is not humanoid, even if they have humanoid characteristics, they are not humanoid, uh, or they are not naturally humanoid, depending on uh, some creatures can shapeshift and those kinds of things. Um, we have it where they're either made, sometimes they're made uh, instead of being born, that's not always the case, but a lot of times creatures can be made instead of born, so if they have that characteristic, they would be a creature versus a being. Um, yeah, those are the main differences for me is all about the humanoid and the cultures. So a lot of creatures don't, not that they don't have society, but they don't have the same kind of cultures and that the beings do. Does that make any sense? If not, please let me know down below because I want to make sure I'm being clear about what I mean between a being and a creature and why I classified them as such. So it would be really helpful for me if I'm confusing you to let me know so I can hopefully clarify better. And as always, you're welcome to comment on whether you think some of my creatures should have been considered beings instead. I'd always love to hear your opinion and why. So the first creature I have on my list here are dragons. So yes, this is one that's like, it's kind of hard to place because the dragons are very smart. The dragons can use magic. The dragons uh, have a lot of culture to them. Uh, they're very sophisticated beings. Uh, Wow, that's a really bad way of putting that, beings. Um, they're very sophisticated creatures that could be like beings, but I felt like they're more creature-esque than being-esque, uh, especially since even though they can become 
humans at some times. We don't really see that in these three very much, but I have seen it in other stories that they can become more humanoid in shape, but that's not their general shape and that's not their general um, society level. They have their, their groups and there's not a lot of different cultures and a lot of different um, essences to them. They have mostly are the dragon shape as well. So I figured that dragons would be considered under a creature. And again, and I feel like we're just running around in circles where you're just like, Amy, you make no sense. <laughs> and that's very possible. So we already covered a couple of traits that uh, the dragons have as creatures. They are very, very, very intelligent. They are pretty much as intelligent as the beings who they let ride them. And sometimes the riders think that they're in charge, but I'm pretty sure most of the time the dragons are in charge. <laughs> um, we've got that they can work magic, which is what allows them sometimes to make a take a humanoid form. It's pretty interesting because some, or actually quite a few, fantasy stories do have dragons that can use magic, and then there are some that don't, and it's very interesting to see the different types of dragons and what makes them unique. For example, these ones, I believe, even though a lot of other ones do allow dragons to have magic, they can't always become humanoid, which I think is interesting in this particular storyline and this particular world that they can do that. Um, we've got that they're very, very, have very personal personalities. And what's interesting about that is because we have two different factions. We've got the good dragons and we've got the evil dragons. And we seem to have quite a few closer looks at the personalities of the evil dragons more so than we see the personalities and the uniqueness of the good dragons. So before I continue with that, let's go ahead and cover what we have for the good and the evil dragons. The good dragons follow Paladine and are on his side of the war to keep balance because both the Takesis and Paladine usually have a balance between their forces to, uh, when they do battle each other. Uh, they've got the Paladine has the bronze, gold, and silver dragons on his side. And then Takesis has the red, blue, green, white, and black dragons. I believe that's all the colors. Uh, I think it's very interesting that the evil side has so many more colors and varieties of dragons than we do on the good side. And as we were mentioning just a second ago, that we see more of the evil dragons than we do of the good dragons. So obviously there's evil dragons in more books than there are the good dragons because of the way the good dragons were bribed into not helping out in the war because their eggs were stolen. Um, but even when we do see the good dragons, we only really have semi-close encounter with two of them. We've got the one that is with Paladine, or aka Fizbin, when he is waiting for the others to pass overhead, and he's watching and he talks to his old senile dragon, who then helps them escape later. Um, and we see a little bit of that dragon's personality, and we see a little bit of the personality of the dragon that Flint and Tass ride when they go up for the very first war, uh, the very first battle where they can fight with the good dragons against the evil dragons. So we see a little bit of their personalities, but not, not too much. We don't actually really go in depth with what the dragon's thinking and feeling as much as we have with the evil dragons. For example, we've got the one that was with Kitiara, the blue one, that black one that was in Pax Tharkis with um, the gully dwarves and where the discs were at when he, uh, that dragon tries to burn everyone alive. Um, so we actually see inside that dragon's head as well. And we see inside the head of the dragon that Verminiard had back in our first book. Uh, Pyre, I believe his name was, if you remember him. He died a uh, very interesting death with fighting the old senile dragon that was guarding the children. We see a little bit of that dragon's personality as well when she's fighting against Pyre and trying to get the children who she believes is hers safety from the dragon. And we see inside the head of the white dragon that chases the group. Yeah, the white dragon that chases the group down in the boat. If you remember when that one was, I believe uh, I know that Sky chases them down with Kitiara uh, in one boat scene, but I believe that there's also a white one that chased them down. I believe it was in book two. 
uh, and is trying to get them as well. So we see quite a few different dragons that are more present in the story. They have personalities, ideas, thoughts, feelings, and we actually see from their point of view instead of from the people who they're with at times. So they're very, very interesting creatures. They're very much at the forefront. Obviously, this is Dragonlance, so it's going to have dragons in it, and they are going to be important, but they do, as creatures, have a um, higher value in being invested in this story and being actual characters in this story. And just because it's not a being, a creature can still be an important part, an important aspect of a story. Okay, let me know if you think I missed anything on the dragon front. Any comments, questions, concerns about that? Uh, let me know again if you think I was correct in classifying the dragons as creatures versus beings. Completely whatever you'd like. I'd love to hear about it. The next creature we've got on our list are the Draconians. And the Draconians are definitely classified as creatures in my opinion because they are made and not born. Uh, they are magically made, yes, but they are not born uh, naturally. They are the good dragon eggs that the evil wizards were and uh, mages were chanting over to uh, corrupt their souls and be born as draconians, which are kind of humanoid in a sense. They do walk on two feet and they do minorly talk, but most of the time they are very creature-esque. They don't have tons of high thinking power. They don't have tons of um, speaking power. They often are used as just to go and do things or to be um, soldiers in the army that the Kentuckyses was raising. So these ones are pretty much just creatures in my book. I don't even see them being considered beings despite their little bit humanoid-esque appearance, especially when they mentioned in uh, the very first book where we've got the clerics that they found out were draconians. Uh, even so though, they also, when they die, they turn to stone and will trap your blades in them or sometimes they explode, whatever else. So they're not natural beings. They are creatures that were made specifically for Tachysis' army. I don't know what happens in the end if all of the dragon eggs were used for as to become draconians or if the good dragons got their eggs back. It's up in the air in that portion. We hope that they got them back after at least Tachysis was banished. Um, but we don't totally know what happened to the draconians as well that were already made. So maybe they are now officially creatures in this story. As you continue reading forward through the books, I guess you will find out. Um, I don't think there's too much else to add about the draconians because even though they are a big portion and they are uh, through all of the books, they don't really have any specific up-close encounters other than fighting them and them being... I guess you could say the most humanoid they are is when they're in the inns and they are drinking and get drunk and that kind of stuff. We do see a little bit of that. But for the most part, they are very, very creature-esque and are just soldiers to be fighting the war against Paladine and the, all the, his people and followers. Okay, and then we've got griffins that are creatures. They are definitely smart as well. We don't know for sure if they're at the same height of... Um, smartness as the dragons, but we do definitely see that they are intelligent. They do follow the Sylvanisti elves, mostly. Those are the people they have sworn loyalty to, and they fly around. We don't have tons of information on the griffins and exactly what they do in the world other than help the Sylvanisti elves, so that is why I labeled them as creatures, since they don't seem to be having any kind of interaction with them as a culture, as a society, as even necessarily a super high intelligence like the dragons. They seem to just serve the Sylvanisti elves and do their own life wherever they have it by the Sylvanisti area. Okay, the last one that I have is the unicorn that is in Darkened Wood. And obviously the unicorn does talk and the unicorn is very smart as well, has its own personality, but it's not very humanoid and really has only a small role. It seems to be just a creature that lives in this forest and protects over the forest. So I didn't classify it as a being. Um, she does definitely send the 
group on their way and is a very uh, patient creature, not a harmful creature. She looks after the forest and the people in it uh, and it's very smart, but very has much more of a smaller role to play in the story. Those are all the creatures that I had listed that I knew of from the first three books that we studied. If there's any other uh, creatures that you would like me to add or discuss, anything else at all, go ahead and let me know on that down below. I always, of course, love to hear your ideas and opinions. All right, so next we have societies. And so all of our beings, not all of them, but a lot of our beings have societies that we have up close personal looks at. So I've made a list of some of the different ones that we have under each being. Of course, as always, as I've mentioned earlier as well, anything I've forgotten or anything that you think I should add, let me know. Let's start with humans. There are two major societies that we really see, in my opinion, up close and personal in these three uh, novels. And the first one is the Barbarians, where Gold Moon and Riverwind are from. We don't actually see them themselves and the fact that the group has already been killed unfortunately before they reach them they just find the remains and the ruins of their clan that they had but we do know them more their society and what they like what they don't like what they believe in from gold moon and riverwind uh, we know that they stoned them and did not like that they were together they tried to send riverwind off on this suicide mission that would never be anything so that way he could never win gold moon's hand we know that gold moon was the chieftain's daughter so obviously they did have the hierarchy of that and that riverwind was very apprehensive of being with her since their society had been killed and, and he wasn't anything of nobility and had been basically shunned out of the clan already so we do see a little bit about what they think and feel from Riverwind and Goldmoon. Obviously, they made their own path as they continued to be with the companions and find their own ideas of what they thought society should be like, what they should be like, and what they should think and feel since they ventured out farther than their own society. So that's the first one. And then the second one we get an even better look at, more up-close personal look at, is the Knights. This is the main human group that we see are these knights which strum has always wanted to be a knight and it's kind of amazing that he really wanted to be a knight considering the knights are such jerks <laughs> in these stories they're very prejudiced they are very proud they are very against all other societies and beings and creatures they are very much humanists and they are very much this is the way it should be they also were a very corrupt group very corrupt among themselves, corrupt on the outside, looking in. It was never really a good sense. The knights were never seen in a good light other than through Strum's admiration of them. And Strum is what tried to make them great again. Unfortunately, a lot of the knights die in the book two when they're in the battle with Kitiara's forces uh, at the Tower of Planthus. But the, good, the knights that were not corrupt are the ones that survived and we hope that the knights can rebuild re-get themselves together and continue to grow in a more positive direction after the whole chronicles of the lance uh, three books yeah so we see both of these societies both of the human societies have a lot of prejudice in them there's the barbarians who are prejudiced against anybody that wasn't human as well and didn't want to be associated with any other types of beings and the knights that were also very prejudiced against everybody that wasn't human and very much prejudiced against each other and themselves uh, as a whole they were so focused in what they wanted and their own thoughts and feelings that they kind of just brushed off the rest of the world it's very sad that the humans are portrayed as one of the most prejudiced people in these stories but it is also at times very realistic of our human society as well so I can't totally blame Margaret Weiss and Trace Hickman for doing that. Okay, next we've got the Elven Societies. And we've got, well, we've got four, but I'm going to do kind of a section of threes. I'm going to put Sylvanisty and uh, Qualanisty kind of together uh, as a little bit of a versus of each other, but they're 
the two that are kind of closely related to each other. So let's start first at the one that we see the least, and those are the sea elves. We see them very, very briefly, so we don't know too much about them. At this point, all we saw was that they were down where Istar is, they live in the water, and they help protect people who are drowning at sea around that area and bring them down to Istar that is sunk into the ocean in order to save their lives. They don't bring people up, they just bring people down. They really care about life, at least enough that they save people who are drowning, uh, those that can be saved, but they aren't really um, interested in the outside world, interested in the world above too much. They do help the couple of companions that get trapped down there and bring them up to the land, just that way they can stop the war from being brought down into the ocean, so it's kind of an own self-preservation type of thing, but they definitely other than that, did not want anything to do with the land above. And then we've got the Kaganesti Elves, or the Wild Elves as they are known. And that's a society that we see even less about. The only one that we really see, the only Kaganesti Elf that we see is the dragon that is pretending to be a elf. Um, but they are considered the runts or the um, not good section of the elves according to the other elves. They're the ones that are shunned and they're the barbarians of the elven society, which is pretty sad considering the, the Kaganisti elves are very nice at allowing the Selvanisti and uh, Qualanisti to share their land when they were booted out of their own homes. We don't really see too much of what they did. They basically just became enslaved to the other elves and uh, are not a very good situation for them, which is very, very sad. So we didn't really get to see up close personal their society and what they were like and their belief systems as much as we saw Qualanisti and Sylvanisti shoving on them what they should believe and how they should think. So we don't see them too close and personal, but we do know a little bit just since they do get run over by the other elves and that they do have niceness, at least in their soul, to let the other elves come and visit them, even if it did mean enslaving them. <laughs> All right, and then we've got the two head honcho sections of elves for this story. We've got our Sylvanisty elves and our Qualanisty elves, who hate each other and they hate the Kaganisty elves. <laughs> we don't really know what they think of the sea elves since they don't interact with them, but both of them hate each other, and both of them are very, very similar. They just don't want to admit it. Uh, they both are very prejudiced against all other types of races. They are also very prejudiced against themselves, other kinds of elves, the ones that are on the opposite side or the ones that they consider lower than them. They are very, very prejudiced people. We don't really know if the Kaganisti were prejudiced, but we'd like to think hopefully they weren't as prejudiced. But definitely the Salvanisti and the Qualanisti elves are very, very prejudiced against everything and anything. They don't Qualanisti hates Sylvanisti and Sylvanisti hates Qualanisti. Just for their minor cultural differences, but for the most part, when you look at them, even their own homelands are very, very similar. They both live in forests, they both have the uh, Speaker of the Suns or the Speaker of the Moon. Very similar beliefs. It's interesting that they just live in slightly different areas and they believe that the other type of elf is so much more beneath them and have this rivalry going. We don't even know where this rivalry came from, really. It just seems to be a very long process of this coming to be. This very long process of them hating each other from a long time ago. I don't know if at one point they were all one group of elves. That is unclear at this point, but they are very, very similar in a lot of ways that they just don't want to recognize. All right, so the next societies we've got are the dwarves. We've got the hill dwarves and the mountain dwarves. And as it seems to be kind of a pattern that we have following here, we do see a rivalry between the hill dwarves and the mountain dwarves. If I remember correctly, Flint is a hill dwarf and he was not very happy that the Mountain Dwarves did, at one point, close their doors to the Hill Dwarves. Yes, close their doors to the Hill Dwarves. That's an interesting statement. Hopefully you understood what I was trying to say. Um, but 
they definitely are they definitely clash with each other they're not happy that they have kind of kicked out of the mountain and that's why they became the hill doors so we don't really know why that happened per se yet either at this point in these three uh books but they do have that little clashing uh, between them as well as obviously the um what are they called the gully doors those also are technically part of the dwarves a little bit though they are separated enough that they are a separate kind of category um, but they are definitely looked down on those gully dwarves as well so it's very interesting that these two societies are clashing but we don't really see much of either of them we do have a little bit of a sense of the mountain dwarves just since they did open their uh, mountain to the refugees from the uh, Vermeard and everything that he was doing to them. So they, after they escaped in our first book, they go to the mountain dwarves and we do see them a bit there. They aren't very excited to have humans and outsiders in their mountain, but they don't not help them. Part of that is because they did bring the mace uh, that forged the dragon lances, so they had compensation and bribery to get them in. So we do see again some prejudice or some holdout on being helpful friendly people from our mountain dwarves the hill dwarves we don't really see much of at all we don't know much about their society of where they actually live nothing other than flint and the couple of pieces that we get from flint so the dwarves though a bigger player as beings they are not known quite as well in this story and really we just know that they have the rivalry and that they are willing to be bribed into their good graces and then we have the gnomes that live inside the mountain that's by um, the knights. So they're a very interesting culture. <laughs> they are the only culture that I see that doesn't care about any race, any type of being, any type of person, any status, rank, whatever. They are just inventors pure of, at heart and they only care about new knowledge, inventing things, and uh, technology, at least the technology of their world and where they're at. Not our kind of technology, but reinventing new ways to do things, ways that are going to be faster, easier for people. Nothing else wants to just know how everything works. They really don't care about people other than that people can provide knowledge to them. So they are one of the few that does not have any prejudice whatsoever in these stories. They welcome Fizbin and Tass to their mountain and they just show them the world that they have there. The very unique, very, very, very unique living situation and all the floors where they shoot them up and uh, catch you as you fall down. <laughs> um, yeah, so the gnomes are kind of treated poorly because no one wants to hear them talk because all they do is continually talk with no stop. But despite being treated and uh, not the best manner and looked down a little bit on, and despite everyone cutting them off all the time, they do help people and they do just enjoy life and enjoy what they can invent and what they can do with it. So I do think that's really interesting that the gnomes uh, really don't care about anything and only care about what they're interested in uh, it's really nice to see a little bit of a fresh society that doesn't doesn't have a problem with everybody else right <laughs> all right and then we have the gully doors we see them a little bit mostly in Pax Tharkis and we see them with Razlan as he enchants them all to be helpful to them and we also see them when they're not enchanted to be helpful especially the high bulb who does try to trick them and get you know treasure and everything else that they have in there they, he really thinks that he's high and mighty gonna trick these these people to give them to the dragon um, but for the most part gully dwarves are not the brightest beings they're not they're not super dumb, like in the fact that they can't even function, but they also are not super smart either. They kind of just do their own thing. They are very much simple beings. They're kind of just at the base of they just want to live, they work, 
sometimes not because they want to, but because they're being forced to by the draconians. But they do just their best to survive. They just like to explore, they like to run around, they argue with themselves a lot. We see that where they all argue over what the secret knock is. So yes, they aren't the brightest bulbs in the bunch, but they are very much simple liver, uh, simple livers, if that makes sense. Like, they just live simply. <laughs> Maybe that's a better way to say it. Um, yeah, so I do think that they're an interesting society, even with Flint uh, saying not very nice things about them, how most dwarves think very nice things about them. Uh, most of the other society don't think very well of them. They think of them more as pests. I think it's very interesting that Razlin, of all people, are the ones that connected most to the Gully Dwarves who were trodden upon and underappreciated. Especially though, even though the Gully Dwarves weren't very happy to be helpful to the humans and isn't necessarily prejudiced in the same way though as the other beings. They just have been trodden upon and so that is where their not instant desire to want to be friendly to strangers that they don't know comes from. It's not because they particularly hate those other races, they just have been treated poorly and understand that. So, yeah, we don't really have too much knowledge on them. We just have the one instance where we really see them get a good picture of how they live and who they are. And then we kind of move on and don't see too much of them afterward. All right, and then last but not least, we've got Kinder. Now, you're probably thinking, like, we never visited any kinder places. We never visited Kindermore, even though we did hear that they conquered Toad, <laughs> uh, the feudal lord Toad, and got their Kindermore back all on their own, which is an amazing feat for the kinder themselves. But kinders are interesting in the fact that their society and their culture is to be dispersed throughout all the other cultures and just go adventuring. So even though there is Kindermore, which is like a dedicated place that a lot of Kinder live, they don't really live in Kindermore because they're always exploring and going out in other places. So I do think that it's very interesting that their society and their culture is to basically not care about anything. <laughs> to just go out and live life to the fullest. To go out and see what there is to see. It does help that they don't really have very much fear of anything, so they're able to just go and do whatever they want. They don't hold any personal possessions. They aren't prejudiced against anybody. They like all cultures. They find all cultures interesting. They, they are not treated the best because everybody else doesn't like that they steal just habitually. Not that they would see it as stealing because possessions are not uh, particular persons. They're for everybody. But they don't let the harshness of others affect them. They still love any and all beings, they interact with any and all beings, they don't hold any hate against any or all other beings, they are just very simple people who just like to go out and explore and live life. And sometimes doesn't that seem like we should do more of the same of that? I know sometimes I do think that the world needs a little bit more of just simplicity and just love and not holding the, the harshness of others against them. Okay. So, those are the societies that I had listed and a little bit of brief bit about all of them. Please let me know if I missed anything or if you thought I should add anything or if there's something that I'm like you thought I didn't really uh, accomplish in talking about them. If you thought I was right, wrong, anything, just let me know down below. All right, and last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about the history of our continent of Antalon here. Um, I have two major things that I think we really see in these three books, and that those histories are important. So the first thing is the Cataclysm. The Cataclysm, which has the sinking of Istar. And of course, we've seen the sunken city of Istar as well in this story, but the Cataclysm is super, super huge because that's kind of where everything starts. That's where the start of where Tychesis was let out was shortly around the Cataclysm time. We also see that the Cataclysm happens because of Lord Soth. Not directly because of Lord Soth, but he could have prevented it and he didn't. So we don't totally know exactly what the Cataclysm is other than 
this giant turning point for the world. We know that the gods are very angry and punished them by sinking Ishtar. And we know that that's when faith in the gods kind of took a nosedive and nobody really cared about the gods anymore. They, they abandoned the gods because of how traumatic this experience was. So we know that Barama became embedded with the jewel about that time. I don't remember specifically it was the exact same time or not, but we do know that he lived before the cataclysm and that the jewel happening uh, situation happened just about the time the cataclysm did. And we do know that Lord Soth could have prevented the cataclysm and chose not to because he was too paranoid about his wife and her cheating on him. So then when he killed her, she cursed him forevermore after his death. And that's how he became uh, a dead knight <laughs> who still has to walk around and live a horrible eternity. So this is like a very big thing. It really affected this, the world. It really affected everybody in it. Everybody knows about the cataclysm. It's kind of like our BC and um, AC uh, time periods before Christ, after Christ. That's where we decide that that's how we're going to label time. Well, there's the before cataclysm and there's the after cataclysm. So yeah, that's the very basis of the cataclysm and exactly how it affects the world and the people in it. A lot of people don't know actually a lot about the world before the cataclysm other than Tass has some maps that were from before the cataclysm which are not very helpful, but they don't actually know a lot about how things are different other than that the gods were much more prominent and that then this giant event happened and the world is how they, it is now. And the world got continued darker and darker as the kisses grew and grew and grew until finally we reach the point that they are at now. Now there might be a whole new age of, you know, after Tychicus is defeated. You'd have to read more books in order for you to know that or not. And then the second historic moment that we know of is brought to us mostly through Strum and the Knights, and that is of Huma and the Silver Dragon. Huma apparently fell in love with the Silver Dragon that he liked, uh, that he rode. Uh, we don't exactly know what happened with that love there, but we do know that he died in battle trying to defeat Tekisis way back when, way before the Cataclysm. Huma is definitely way before the Cataclysm. So he was always considered to be legend and not truth. But as we go through these books, we do see actually that Huma has a lot of reality to him. We see that him is tomb. We see his lance we see the lances in the iceberg as well so we see that those were actually real things not just legend things we know the legend that he followed the um the doe the glowing doe through the woods and it led him down his path and that's what strum does in darkened wood that leads them to the unicorn and continues on their journey so we do see that Huma definitely did exist and he did defeat Tachysis the first time, or at least the last time that she came down. We don't know exactly how many times she's tried to do this, but we believe that that was the first time, was that Huma fought Tachysis and won for the world. So yeah, that's very interesting just because we have the similarities between that time and this time. We have that kind of as a guide, especially for Strum, between what he feels is right and wrong as he continues his journey through the nights. And we see how that affects the at least the second half of the group when we're with Lorana's group because they go to the tomb and they end up finding out about the good dragons and all that. So everything from Huma's legend comes back around and shows that it's actually history and helps them defeat Tachysis in the present. And there you have it. Those are my two main things from history that we really learn about this world and how it's affected this world and how it helps them in the time that they're in now. If there's anything that I missed that you think is really historic that was important, I guess we could also mention uh, the Chronicler because he has seen all through time and he chronicalizes it. But I don't really feel like we have a specific thing in history that he would be related to. He just knows all the history, so I don't really feel like he, other than being a part of history, is really super something that's historic. He does have a play, part to play in this story, but 
not quite as a historic event, if that makes sense. But if there's anything else that you think I missed for anything, whether it's the creatures, the societies, or our histories for this part, go ahead and let me know down below. If there's anything that you feel like I didn't make sense at, or anything else that is part of the whole general world analysis that I missed in either part one, two, and three, and you would have liked me to talk about it, please let me know as well. I would love to hear from you, love to know your feedback, love to uh, hear your side of the story and how you think and how you feel so that way I can have a discussion with you and we can both learn together as always. If you don't want to comment down below, you can also go ahead and check out my Twitter, which is at fantasyfiction1. Or you can email on uh, our class email, which is listed in the about page. So yeah, thanks so much for being so patient with me and especially with the holidays, not uh, putting up any classes. I am hoping to get back into the swing of things. And I know sometimes I say that often and then it doesn't happen, but really with this new year, I'm going to try and get us back on track so we can have lots of new discussions especially with our Mercy Thompson book, Bloodbound. We only discussed the first four chapters, but next class we will be able to discuss the next four chapters. And yeah, I will see you then. Bye.